takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podium anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Anita McCuit, and I am president of the Canadian Club Toronto and national leader of technology, media, and telecom at PwC. What do video games and politics have to do with each other? Well, in the recent U.S. election, video games were a key tool in reaching a wide, whole new audience, many who were just old enough to vote for the very first time. Today, we're joined by a panel of industry leaders to learn how brands and politicians are using the popularity of video games and social media to get their message out. We'll also chat about the changing ways that we all consume and interact with entertainment and how marketers can use these platforms to reach their target audience. Today's panelists will tell us why these changing consumer patterns aren't just a trend, but rather a deeper shift and disruption that will have implications for data, access, fandom, and community. But before we dive into today's topic, here's some information about how you can participate with us. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio should stay strong. And we do want your questions today. So if you have any questions for us, just click the questions tab, type them in the window, and they will go straight to our moderator. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit, and we've been gathering people together for 124 years. And it's because of our sponsors that we're able to do that. So thank you to today's event sponsor, Norton Rose Fulbright. We are grateful for your support today. Now to introduce today's panelists. Heidi Browning is Chief Marketing Officer for the NHL. Adrian, Mont Adrian Montgomery is the Chief Executive Officer of Enthusiast Gaming. And Allison Stern was the Digital Partnerships Manager for the Biden-Harris 2020 campaign. Today's discussion will be moderated by Amanda Lang, host of Bloomberg Markets on BNN Bloomberg. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is the toast that we make to our country at the start of every event. So if you have a drink nearby, please raise your glass, nod to the screen, and join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. Amanda, I'll turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Thank you so much for that, Anita. I really appreciate it. And I'm delighted to be here with our uh, panelists. Um, and I'll ask all of them to unmute themselves now. Uh, as Anita mentioned, we're also very happy to take your questions, uh, particularly because I know we have a lot of expertise uh, joining us today. And your questions will help us direct the conversation where you want it to go. Um, but I know from these three people that, that we have a lot of ground we can cover, a lot of knowledge uh, of both uh, current and historical about where we've been. So welcome, Adrian, Allison, Heidi. Um, and I think where I'd like to start, because this is such a, I mean, in some ways it's new, in some ways it's as old as the hills. Uh, and we'll kind of dig into the ways that, that it differs. But Anita just alluded to the way this story came to the mainstream press's attention, really. And I know for you guys, it'll probably feel... Uh, really late uh, for it to have come to our attention, but it really was the Biden-Harris campaign 
choosing last October to run a three week uh, campaign across enthusiast gaming's platforms using games like Fortnite, reaching this whole new audience in a whole, what felt like a whole new way. So what I'm gonna ask each of you to do, and I'll ask you to start Adrian and get the backstory from Allison and then Heidi, please weigh in on, on how this is unfolding for you right now. How is gaming hitting your marketing uh, kind of uh, viewpoint right now? Uh, but Adrian, go back to last fall and this notion that your platforms could be used in a slightly different way. Well, first of all, thank you, Amanda. And it's great to be here with, with Heidi and Allison. Um, certainly one of the proudest things we ever did was to play a role, a small role in, in helping uh, the Biden team execute their vision and their strategy, which was to engage with young people. And um, for us, we're a company that reaches 300 million people a month, mostly Gen Zs, mostly millennials. And the mere fact that a presidential campaign recognized that gaming is a core part of young people's identities. And if you're going to have meaningful conversations with them, you've got to come to their turf. You've got to speak to them in their language. And I think the fact that a presidential campaign recognized that and crafted a strategy around that was, was exceptional. Allison, from the point of view of the campaign, how did this unfold? Uh, you know, when, when did the idea germinate and when did you kind of figure that this was the way to reach this group? I think from day one on the campaign, um, well before I even joined, there was a strategy of reaching people where they are, and um, you know, President Biden is a is a is a deeply empathetic person, and um, and you know, one of his core strengths is connecting with people across the country and on the campaign trail, and when faced with a global pandemic, where for safety reasons you know, people couldn't be out and about in the same way. There was a strategy to reach people where they are on the internet. And I think it all, it all started with that. And, um, and gaming was just one, you know, small piece of the puzzle. There was a, there was a, um, you know, a digital team of, of 200 people and, um, you know, and, and led by really strong leaders who, um, who wanted to, to find ways to, to reach people where they are. And that included, you know, through Facebook content, through social media, through gaming, through, um, through cooking videos and dog videos and, um, and, you know, through, through new and emerging platforms. And there was just really a, a, a focus on wanting to connect with people and young people and bring young people into the political process and, and speak with them in a way that would connect with them. Heidi, what about from your point of view in terms of how you, you're thinking about it, how long you've been thinking about it, where does it fit, these new platforms fit into the NHL strategy? Well, they're hugely important parts of our strategy for reaching and connecting with young people. You know, we have a, a youth advisory board called the NHL Power Players. They're 13 to 17 year old advisors who are absolutely passionate about everything. And they advise us on all things, media, technology, culture, sports, hockey, you name it. And gaming is the number one topic uh, that we spend a lot of time on. And it's about even more than esports. Uh, of course, they love their NHL 21, uh, but they also talk about gaming in, t in terms of um, free to play games, right? And that whole gamification of everything in life. And what gaming does is it offers them the thing that's one of the many aspects that are really important Important to them, like personalization, the ability to customize, the ability to have your identity, as Adrian was talking about, of who you are today or who you wish you were. And so uh, we also see it as a path to fandom because when you get so involved in these uh, video games and esports, you know every player, you know the rules, you uh, you also adopt players from other teams that might not even be in your own market, but you start to familiarize yourself with their skills, etc. So we think that is a um, a huge opportunity for us to expand our fandom. So I, I want to just take one step back um, because for obviously for marketers, um, both for those with a message to sell, and that can be a political campaign or it can be a, a you know a business uh, or it can be a, a sports franchise, and the platform. In some ways, the game hasn't changed. You're just trying to get a message. You're trying to get it to the right people um, in a format that's appealing. Uh, 
but I imagine that a lot is different about crafting a campaign for a, a, this type of audience on this type of platform. So uh, Adrian, I'm actually going to come at it kind of backwards and, and say, you know, you're opening up your platform. Um, it was Fortnite, uh, one of the most popular games on the planet with a massive embedded audience. What's your sense of what the right tool is or what it should look like or how cautious are you about what the content looks like? Because you are, of course, the gatekeeper of the quality of your own material. Yes, and I think that what what is really important to stress here, and we have uh, two other experts who, whose uh, perspective would be rather illuminating, things have changed in a very significant way. And <clears throat> again, we all know in life that when you have a lot of choices, you have a lot of power. And when you have a lot of power, you can set terms. And I'll use, you know, if four people decided to show up on your driveway and make you an offer to buy your house. I don't know if you'd buy your, if you'd sell your house, but I certainly know that if you did, you'd be setting the terms of that purchase and sale agreement. And what we have to remember today, unlike when I was growing up, Amanda, and perhaps others, is young people from a content perspective, from an information perspective, can get what they want, when they want, where they want, how they want, and as much of it as they want. So they have the power, they have the choices, and they can set the terms. And so the most fundamental shift, and I think gaming is a conduit to that, but not the be all and end all, is when you have that power, you must recognize it as a company or as a campaign, and you have to speak to them and recognize that you've got to go to their turf and talk to them in terms they understand because they can shut you off. And the other thing I would say, they're not just consuming content. They're not just taking what's on offer as I would have. What's the movie theater playing? Do I like it? If they don't like content, they create their own. They share their own content. They make their own videos. So sometimes it's like, sorry, Disney, I know you spent a hundred million on this movie, but my friend's cat is stuck in the laundry basket and that video has gone viral and I'm really digging it. That, that, that's changed so much. So the medium and the message have to be bespoke. And that's a service that Enthusiast Gaming and others in our industry provide. Hi, dear Allison. Do you have a, something to add on that just in terms of, uh, of what the message needs to look like? Uh, and I guess, we, Allison, you could be very specific here, although we should note for folks that haven't looked Allison up, uh, she's an entrepreneur and a digital expert who actually created one of the tools used to measure online success of, of marketing campaigns. Um, so you, even beyond Biden-Harris, what are some of the metrics that you're, you're looking at here to say, you know, what should this look like so we know it works? I think um, so. You know, gaming is is massive. Um, it's it's not a small niche thing. It's literally you know the core entertainment for a broad swath of the population. Um, I think it's like you know seventy five percent of American households have a gamer in the household, mm -hmm. and I think there's like one hundred and sixty million gamers in the U S. Um, so it's really just just massive. I mean, we're not we're not talking about you know, small niche, we're, t we're talking about reaching a really broad group of people and this is how they um, entertain and uh, get entertained. And I think, um, you know, Adrian brings up a really uh, interesting point around the creator and creator content. I think when you're, you know, when you're looking at gaming or even entertainment today, there's, you know, there's the, the game itself, you know, and so for us, the Biden campaign, you know, did work in Fortnite and Animal Crossing um, and and there's there's the game itself and and that is a canvas and how you do work there and then there's um, the work with with the with the creators and influencers who um, who who play that game and who bring you know shed light and bring audiences to that game and so it's kind of essential to to do both um, and and to do both as authentically as possible. Um, and so, and then when you look at the creator landscape, and um, and, and I, I, I co-founded a company called Tubular, which is um, the measurement standard for online video. And you know, there's um, Tubular measured over six billion videos across the internet globally, and there's like you know 25 million influencers ranging from having 200 followers to to you know hundreds of millions. And so understanding that landscape, understanding 
you know, who the gamers are. And, and, and for the buying campaign, we only worked with, with U.S. creators and influencers. So understanding, you know, who, who were those U.S. Um, uh, gamers and who were their, who was their following. And, and we worked with some that were big and some that were small. And so understanding all those different levers and, and how you create content and how you um, grow audience is essential for any type of campaign, whether it's a political campaign or a brand campaign. Um, and it, it's, it's essential to, you know, to the work with the right people, whether it's right agencies or right creators to, to get the job done in that way. And I think that's that Allison and Adrian in that it doesn't matter if you're looking at the best esport gamer in the world or politician or major league sports star. What young people want is that human personal connection with these people they view as the goats of their industries, right? And so that idea of, you know, understanding, uh, you know, you might be the best athlete on ice, but they really want to know what you're like off the ice. What are your interests? How do you contribute back to society? What makes you a goat? What do you eat? How do you work out? Um, what's your family like? These are really important um, aspects that round out the total, the total picture of who these stars are. And so that's been a big shift for us is really trying to peel back the visors and really showcase and share the, share the lives and personalities of our athletes because we know it's so important. And what we see in the numbers is that in sports, young people are following athletes first then teams and then leagues and in fact they'll even follow athletes of sports they don't even watch just because they're interesting humans so we we step back and we call it humans are greater than highlights because everyone can relate to a human moment uh, and you know, want to learn about how to be good enough to be captured in a highlight it occurs to me um and, and the the enthusiast biden harris partnership uh, to me highlights it but i imagine this is is a a pitfall that could come up anywhere when you're embedding content into another platform. And that is, uh, I think uh, audiences of all types are quite well aware when there's a discrete message. So whether that's an old TV ad or you're adding your newspaper or even your pop-up ad, when it's embedded in the content, you're getting into new territory. And Adrian, I was, I'm curious, you know, were, were you worried at all that, you know, across America, there are now 70 million young Republicans who think of Fortnite as the democratic game. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you expose yourself to aligning with certain messages and partners uh, that could be a risk to your business? That's certainly a concern and a, and a valid one. And, I, I, you know, we've tried to stress as, as proud of, as we are of, of our involvement in what we think, and kudos Allison and her team, was a, was a transformational moment in how American politics, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Gen Zs, is going to be conducted in the future. Whatever small role we were, were fortunate to play, we're proud of that. But we also stress, to your point, that we are a media company. Uh, we're not taking sides, um, but we do play a bit of a different role than a radio station running ads or a television station running ads, because we're also helping, when asked, to craft a more of a bespoke message to a unique audience. So the, the nature between the relationship between client uh, and a company like our, our, ours changes as a result. So that is a valid concern. And one of the things Allison mentioned, which is so true, the rise of the influencer in social media cannot be ignored uh, by marketers any longer. Um, young people are highly impressionable, highly influenced by the people that they follow on social media. And again, these, these gamers, as an example, and I recognize gamers aren't the only social media influencers, they are the most popular, but they're streaming 10, 12 hours a day. And as a result, the risk of them saying things and creating controversies um, is greater. This isn't prepackaged half an hour a day on Entertainment Tonight stuff. That's not the way of the world anymore. So the risk level does go up. Brand safety does become a more heightened concern, and, and companies like ours um, have to be more nimble and more sensitive to it. One one quick note on that: we um, we were really in, in in talking to creators and working with creators. We were really um, uh, felt strongly that that the message was about getting young people to vote. And we did not say, you know, we did not say you need to say this or here are talking points. It was really meant to be, you know, 
uh, talking about why voting is important and focusing on that and and even focusing on issues that young people care about and so two of the um, gamers that we worked with really um, seized on climate as an issue they cared deeply about and there were pieces in the Fortnite game that talked to um, the connection between um, climate and and the economy and jobs and um, and so, you know, we didn't even give them the talking point of climate. They played the game. They sort of saw some of these pieces in it that spoke to them. And they called that out as they walked through because it spoke to them. And that was really our goal in working with young people is to say, hey, we're, we're trying to um, spread the message of voting. And we're trying to sped, spread the message of what, you know, the Biden-Harris campaign stands for and cares about. And, and we'd like you to talk about what connects, what you feel connected to. And and that and that worked really well because I think it was it was an authentic message for everybody. Which gets to some a place that um, I'm really interested in around uh, the sort of line that you walk or you get close to when you're trying to like work a message to an audience that fits with sort of what they're interested in, their narrative. So in this, let's use this as an example, because it's one uh, that I have, I had some uh, immediate reaction to, which is, as I understand it, and I'm going to say I, I don't play Fortnite, although I have a 15 year old who knows all about it, uh, that, that in the game, there was a task uh, related to this campaign uh, in which players could remove industrial sludge from a river. Um, and the river was called Aviator River. Uh, and as a business journalist, I looked at that and thought, wow, uh, the aviation industry is not happy about that. Why is it called Aviator River? Are planes really the worst offenders on emissions? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Actually, the servers that are running this game are worse, or even worse emitters than the airplanes in the air. Um, I, I, what, what worried me was this sort of amorphous grasp on fact and truth that we know we all live with. It's in the political discourse, it's out there. Uh, and when kids live in echo chambers, young people live in echo chambers, I worry that they're being fed things they already believe rather than uh, things that are just pure solid fact. And I don't know, Allison, do you wanna, do you wanna I think you may all have thoughts about this, but do you wanna weigh in on this? Well, it's funny you jumped to that because actually the reason it's called Aviator River is because um, President Biden loves aviator sunglasses, and that's like a big piece <laughs> of his um, of his uh, uh, sort of, you know image. And he that's just we sort of had fun facts in there. You know, Champ and Major the dogs were in there, and um, and um, Vice President Harris, you know, became known on the internet for her sneakers. So there was sort of like golden sneaker challenge. So we tried to um, sprinkle in fun pieces of um you know of, of of their identities um in addition to so so that specific challenge the game itself and we worked with a um fortnite build team to um two really talented creators who who, who built that game inside of fortnite and one thing for the audience is you know fortnite is actually a platform um where it's a, there's a core game to it but there's an, a, a way for for creators to actually build experiences and other and 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 certain brands have actually, um, I think Grubhub and and a few others have actually built um, built sort of island experiences within it. Uh, and so you know we worked on six challenges that illustrated actually uh, the Biden Harris Build Back Better plan. Uh, so it was like a bit educational, which we really were passionate about as well. And so that specific challenge um, had to do um, with the with the um, Climate Corps and. Um, and some ideas around um, employing young people to um, in sort of environmentally friendly um, task forces to you know help improve our, our country and our infrastructure and our climate and this idea that you know it's very very intertwined um, you know climate and, and the economy and jobs and so you know that was something fun where you got to ride a hoverboard and shoot a harpoon and and collect things um, out of the river, uh, and and um, you know bring something fun to it. But there were sort of little signposts along the way that explained why, and uh, and so you know that was uh, be because we had sort of the opportunity to partner with creators who who built this. You know we were able to sort of bring the policy forward as well, which I think is is really exciting. And Peter, anything to add on that? 
I was just going to add that um, the notion that they get caught in an echo chamber, I don't think is, um, is really accurate because this generation consumes more content across more channels and filters more information and retains it at the speed of light. And so I think they're more curious than anything. And the, and the challenge really is for us to cut through and get the attention in the channels that we want them and need them in addition to going to where they're spending their time and getting their information. But love what Allison's talking about are using the, the fun to educate on bigger problems in society. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think I, I'm not as articulate as my colleagues, so I would just say that we, sh we can all feel a little bit good that young people have the greatest bullshit detectors in the history of, uh, in the, history of, of the world, and they use it uh, rather freely and rather effectively, and it's, it's not fun when you're on the wrong end of it. Um, you know, I would also say that to Allison's point, one of the things that was uncovered uh, in this last election through the methods that people employed was that, yes, young people presumed to have been apathetic, presumed to not want to go out and vote. They're very passionate uh, about issues that they care about. They're very issue-driven. Climate change is an excellent example. And it gets back to what I said earlier. They can source as much information anytime they want. Um, and when they're passionate about those issues, they do go out and get themselves informed. And again, they're not going to be force-fed content. They're going to want to have a role in curating and making their own content. And that changes the game and empowers them in a way that we were never empowered before. You know, I use the example, and it, when I was a teenager, if I wanted to go home in, in the summer months and watch something new on TV, I couldn't. It was rerun season. Like, you know, if I wanted to go to HMV and buy three songs for my favorite bands, I had to buy three albums. We had to take what was on offer. Young people do not have to do that, um, and that's highly empowering to them. We have uh, some questions from our, uh, our audience, and I want to get to one that you're kind of hitting on here, but um, it's that there's, there is this stereotype for millennials and Gen Z uh, that they're lazy, unmotivated, they don't want to get involved. Uh, it sounds as though your experience has not been that uh, with, with, this, with these groups. Uh, where do you see it, Heidi? Where do you see that stereotype being overturned? Uh, because it does exist out there. That, and I mean, I guess even the idea of somebody sitting gaming, uh, it seems like they're kind of unmotivated and uninvolved um, in anything but gaming. But I guess we're, what we're trying to do is sort of upend that view and say, actually, they're involved in that thing. And that thing is more than just a game. Well, look at the number of y young uh, Gen Zers that start companies uh, before they even graduate from high school, right? They, if you think about it, they are, um, they've been born with technology in their hands since the beginning. They are empowered, as Adrian was talking about earlier. They, there's no question they don't know the answer to, and they really believe in their role in innovation. And if you as a brand don't innovate, they'll innovate on, on your behalf. And because they have this sense of empowerment and the sense of innovation and this strong um, compass of what they want to do to create change in the world, this is where they're creating these companies. And we call them the Gen ZEOs. Uh, and you know, we I've met many, many of them who've already had three companies before they get out of, uh, out of high school, legitimate companies that have been crowdsourced and funded and are making money and have sold. And so I think that these, this is act. They won't just have the ideas, but they actually act on the ideas. Allison or Adrian, anything to add to that? Awesome. I mean, I think that's just such a wrong, I hope nobody on the line, like, actually believes that, because I just, you know, I think it's essential for different generations to just have empathy within the generations and understand that, you know, that there's differences. I think we all learn that even with, um, you know, the current pandemic and the amount of Zooming, Zoom that's going on, you know, or, or like in office time, you know, people might have said, you know, with um, with the millennial workforce, oh, you know, they just, you know, they don't come to the office in the same way. And I think we maybe learned through the pandemic that like maybe we don't need to go to the office. Maybe you can be efficient through Zoom and 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 doing your work, but doing other things as well. And I just think um, it's essential to to you know differences aren't negatives. I, I think there's every you know generation brings something to the table. And I think as 
marketers, it's essential to reach people where they are and not um, without any kind of judgment about about them or how they spend their time or, or anything. It's just, hey, if this is, you know, if, if 75% of American households have a gamer in them, I mean, it's y y you have to be doing things with gaming. You have to reach people where they are and um, and speak to people in a way where they're receiving that information. You can't like write off a generation. You know, this is a a, a, a rising group of people with um, with extreme ext with extreme power, whether that's buying power, or voting power, or um, you know, who deeply care about issues and care about the world that they're inheriting. Um, and so I think just you know the message is to is to treat everyone with respect and to find ways to to connect with them um, in the channels by which they they prefer to receive information. Yeah, young young people are different, and and one of the things that happens too much, and we experience it, and I'm sure my my colleagues experience it, is people try and understand this new behavior by trying to apply it to their own paradigm. Well, when I was young, and it's just profoundly different. Um, there's no other way to describe it. And so gaming is not a hobby. Yes, Mr. or Mrs. Chief Marketing Officer, 35 years ago when you played Pac-Man, it was highly antisocial. Uh, your parents were worried you might get scurvy because you hadn't seen the sun in three days. What's gaming today? Young people are not going on Facebook. Their gaming is their social network. My CFO had two people at his wedding he'd only ever met on the Xbox console. That's, you try telling him that those aren't real friendships, those aren't real relationships. One of the things that we've struggled with in the past, and it's changing a lot, but some people would tell you, us in a boardroom, I, I'm sorry, I can't understand why people would watch other people play video games. Meanwhile, that person's friends and family in the last 48 hours might have seen Martha Stewart based a turkey, uh, someone hoard a bunch of stuff in their attic, someone sell real estate uh, in Los Angeles. All of that is acceptable. But yet watching other people play video games, you know, can't be a productive way to spend your time. So we have to recognize the sands have shifted. Behavior is different. That doesn't mean they're lazy. In fact, there were a lot of times in my career I'd be afraid to raise the issues in my company that my young colleagues raise and are not afraid to do so. And quite honestly, it's making us a better business. Um, I don't think they're lazy. I just think they're different. Yeah, I mean, I think there certainly there, those of us with gamers in our lives, uh, and the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of our view of all of this stuff. I think understand that they're not down there alone. It's in the basement of my house. Uh, there, there's that's how they see their friends. It's a, it's a community. It's connectivity. It's a social experience. All of that obviously is is why this is working from the point of view of messaging. Uh, we have some great questions. A couple of them kind of overlap here. Um, one is. Uh, you know, you can see how important it is when things go viral in a campaign, you know, a meme or the like. Um, but but the question is, how do you uh, how do you make it go viral? How do you know something is going to hit? Uh, and, the, and the other question is, what are the three top tips for success and engagement? Kind of similar, but I mean, obviously, this is the this is why you get paid the big bucks in marketing. Uh, but but it is interesting. What have you seen that really works? Um, and Heidi, I'll start with you, Allison and Adrian, you, I'm sure you have thoughts about this, but when you've seen something, what is it that, that really hits with this particular group or platforms? I guess I could speak to our biggest meme who is gritty, uh, that was like a, a fantastic surprise that came to the league, right? And you, the first thing is you never know when you're gonna have, if you try to create a meme, it's not gonna be successful. It has to be authentic. It has to be adopted uh, by by grassroots, you know, involvement uh, uh, from fans. But gritty, you know, when uh, Philly had introduced him to their, a lot of uh, criticism from, you know, their fans and their fan base, and they got chirped a little bit by the penguins, all of a sudden when that chirp came from the penguins, 
Philly fans rallied around Gritty, and Gritty was their guy, and they were not going to turn their back. They weren't going to criticize him. And then Gritty did the um, cultural connection with making fun of uh, Kim Kardashian uh, pouring champagne over her back, and he did that shot. He did that exact same pose and broke the internet. And from that night on, Gritty was on every talk show. He was on the you know in the morning shows. He's in has been woven into pop culture in every way possible. And so it's like capturing lightning in a bottle. There's no form or a recipe for it, but when you have it, you need to ride the wave. Adrian or Allison? For me, for me, that that is 100% true. I, I certainly can't walk into a, a staff meeting and tell someone to make some content and make sure it's viral. <laughs> um, it, 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 there is a, you know, we, we manage to run a predominantly user-generated content business uh, fairly well. And what I would tell you, and I'm, I'm glad there's only a thousand people tuning in because I shouldn't let this get out, but it, I, I don't even know how to explain how we manage that well. Uh, Allison's used a very important word a few times, which is it has to be authentic. But we all know authentic's not an active word. I can't ask anyone tuning in to go stand in the corner and be authentic for us. Um, so it's very hard to describe, but again, being very disciplined about going to, to the person you want to, going to that young person's turf, talking to them at their level, understanding their perspective, not trying to foist things on them. Those are the things that you have to do um, in order to get that tick mark that, yes, you know, you, you, you resonated with, with me in a, in a genuine way. We have you know, young kids, you have a 15 year old when, when your kid was young, when you talk to them, like they were a real person and not making goo goo, you know, noises and stuff like that. That's when the relationship strengthens. And so it's talking to people at eye level and understanding their world from their perspective. Those would be my tips. And I'll add to that. Uh, and this is really drawing on my time from tubular, um, which you know, we had, it, it's a data platform that's used by, you know, 250 enterprise um, customers ranging from BuzzFeed to, um, you know, to, to, to the Washington Post to, um, to Viacom. And, um, you know, I think what I would always say in advising, advising people trying to create content, number one is don't bank on a viral video. That's like putting your life savings in a lottery ticket. You know, you just don't, don't do that. Um, and so there's kind of three C's of success. One is content, the second is consistency, and the third is collaboration. And so first and foremost, it's about the content. You know, you're, you, you, it's got to be good. It's got to connect with an audience. You know, there has to be something um, special about it, you know, and, um, and that, that hits the zeitgeist in some way. Um, but, but you have to you have to build a foundation for that it doesn't it doesn't come out of nowhere typically and so this idea of consistency you know if you're a if you're a, a for example like a youtube star that's trying to build an audience or a brand or, or what have you you know you need, need to be putting out regular content people need to understand okay it comes out on tuesdays or you know this is a series that we're doing and building um and sort of build that audience so that when you you've um you know that when something goes viral it's um, there's sort of a foundation there that 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 it came from in some way, and then the third piece is collaboration. So if you're, you know, if you are, if you don't have much of an audience, the way to start to build an audience is to work with other creators and influencers and um, and 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 partner in that way and share audience and grow together. Um, and so I think you know you just you got to get out there and start building your content engine and. Um, and, and by the way, you know, while viral is amazing, you know, that's the internet moves so fast that it's, you know, that it's done. And so you actually would prefer to have a bit more of a consistent audience. And I think, um, Gritty has been amazing in that, like, it's not just a, you know, one hit wonder. There's sort of this continuous, continuous content that comes out around it. Um, and so I think actually your goal should not be viral. Um, it should be built to build a, a passionate and consistent audience and to um, to really connect with people and 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 build. 
one of the questions asked here, um, and I can tell, I know there are a lot of people who probably think about marketing for a living and messaging and reaching people. Uh, and it has to do with just the evolution of platforms. What What's different about marketing on a gaming platform versus uh, Reddit uh, or TikTok, or you go back at what, you know, you might say back a generation to the Facebooks uh, of the world. Um, how, how is it evolving? How does your thinking change around how you're going to do it based on how those platforms are consumed? Yeah, content's really short now. The attention span on content has gone down and continues to decline. Uh, you, uh, you know, there's a mix of highly professional produced content and real and raw, and you're always optimizing that. And so often you see the real and raw get a lot more engagement than the perfectly produced. So it's a mindset, a mindset shift for a lot of marketers uh, about how and when and where you spend your resources and what is good uh, at, at quality content. So I think really suspending judgment on that and making sure that you're getting, you know, the, the real, the raw, the user generated combined with your professional content and making it quick uh, and then optimizing the content by platform every platform is different a reddit platform uh, you know just by their Super Bowl ad alone that was the most reddit thing you could do right uh, it was fantastic um, that you want to have a different engagement there than you want to in Instagram stories for example and and every platform is different you know you really every platform is different that's the most important thing to remember right you wouldn't put the same piece of content on tv that you put on the radio and you wouldn't put the same piece of content that you put on you know youtube on instagram on facebook on TikTok. and i i know as a marketer it's very challenging because you have a limited amount of you know resources and bandwidth and so i think you know, everything starts with data and understanding where your audience lives and who you're actually trying to speak to. And then understanding who's on each platform and then understanding the content you create for each platform. And it, and it's, it is, um, you know, essential to be deliberate in that way. You can't just put a piece of content somewhere and then we cut it for other ones. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, um, and then the other piece of advice is, you know, it's also good to keep a finger on the pulse of rising platforms because that's where you really have the chance to um, to break through. You know, it's it gets, you know, the biggest stars on YouTube are the ones who were there in the early days and built an audience. And there's always people who break through over time, but it's so much easier, you know, to be first to, you know, for example, Clubhouse is a is a is a is a trendy new platform. You know, if you're if you're one of the first people there, you're going to build up an audience faster. And I think, you know, obviously you don't want to waste resources on platforms that might go away. But I think one, one of the pieces of a marketer is just understanding where your audience lives, creating the right content for that platform and trying to be first um, when you can so you have a bit of a head start. And it's interesting you say um, wasting resources on platforms that might go away. So far, none of them have gone away, right? Facebook still has, you know, a billion people on it. You've got Snapchat. People still use that. You know, TikTok was going to be gone, and all of a sudden now you're getting billions of views on it. They, they are here. They appeal to different people at different times, and you use different platforms for different reasons. Like just going through a day in the life of a young person, and what's the first thing they check? Is it, you know, is it their Snapchat? Is it their Instagram? Is it their face they have a, a distinct order in which they go to check in on what's happened in life before they start their own uh, day so i think it's really interesting it does make it so challenging from a marketer perspective though to yeah. think about you know how do you have meaningful and relevant content for each of those platforms and that's just the the fun that we get to have in this new world yeah and i think you have to hire people who live and breathe those platforms and i also think there are data and tools um, to help you understand them, you know, so for example, just by the data, the, 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 the stars on Instagram are all traditional celebrities, you know, people that, who, who, who you know, whose names you would, you would recognize, um, you know, um, uh, pop stars and, 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 and celebrities, singers, you know, and, and, but on YouTube, it's a completely different group of people on TikTok. It's a completely different group of people. And you, you just, you have to know that there's actually data and tools now and, and, you know, that, that tells you that information and it's, it's not okay to say, you know, I, I, it, I just don't know. I mean, you, you can, you can go on the platforms and click around and look, you can use data and tools. You can hire people who have that DNA. You can work with agencies you trust who have that DNA. 
um, but the the information is available and it's it's essential to um, to work with the right types of people and 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 tools to um, to be successful. But also, it bears repeating too that there's all kinds of new platforms and all kinds of new ways for marketers to connect. And again, I've said it enough. You have to go to where where you have to fish where the fish are. However, it really come. It, it, I can guarantee you, we could talk about synergies all day long. But if you push ordinary anemic content through an exciting distribution channel, it will get no play. It, it really begins and ends with content. And so when you think back, try to use another political example, yes, social media helped propel Barack Obama to the presidency, but you know he was Barack Obama, a pretty charismatic guy. It didn't work so well with John McCain. The dis you have to serve at the altar of content. And Allison used three new C words that, that I like. I would add a fourth, which is compel. Every meeting you have about your content, you've got to be out of the box. You've got to compel. Uh, Heidi's right, you know, short form content. You've got to capture people's attention and imagination early. So always think, how can I compel? How can I compel a reaction? I, I want to hit on a subject that's not specific to anything um, that you guys are doing or have done, and yet it kind of underpins all of it, which is the data. Uh, what's different here is all of the information uh, at, that is now available to the marketers, to the companies that want a message, um, and the people that are selling their platforms to do so. And it may be more true of other platforms. So I'm not, I'm not sort of making this specific to, to you three, but it doesn't feel as though our policies and our frameworks have necessarily kept pace with, as they, as they never do, with the innovation and the speed and the new technologies. Uh, do you worry about that? Do you think about it? Is it uh, do you think your communities uh, will concern themselves with how their data is being shared or used or manipulated or any of the things? And you know, we can throw in the mix here really nefarious use, like Russian interference in elections. Uh, you know, what if enthusiast gaming's platforms become a, a way that some foreign actor tries to manipulate our elect your elections? Um, there, so there are multiple levels to this, but I'm just kind of curious whether you think the policies in place now protect all of the participants. And Adrian, I'll start with you because you're obviously you're running a business and you've got to think about all of your privacy issues and your data controls. It's, it's exceedingly important, Amanda. And again, what we, you know, what we feel is, is going to be beneficial for us in the long term. We have to make that a priority, of course. But again, I think what is happening, we could debate the motivations for why what's about to happen is going to happen, but third-party data is going to become harder and harder to access. Um, and so third-party cookies, I, people like me exist in uh, a number of different data sets and you can be a lazy marketer and rely on third-party data. And, and I think that's not going to be uh, the way to go in the future. Certainly for us, <laughs> aggregating first-party communities and, and engaging meaningfully directly with our audience, I think will, will increase in value over time because there is a privacy revolution happening and we have to be very mindful about it and so do marketers. And from our perspective, um, agree with you that first party data is so uh, important and, and we've been focusing a lot on how do we harness all this data. You've got your real world data, you've got your digital data, uh, and, and, how, and all the transactional data that happens when you buy a jersey, buy a ticket, go to a game, you know, participate in social media. All of this creates a picture about who you are. And what we try to do is use this to help us personalize our communications to our fans. And this is another really important part of the young generation is they, wa they want you to show me you know me. I'll reward you with my attention if you reward me with the content that is relevant to me. And so uh, the, the laws that are around privacy are hugely important uh, and all the data privacy that we have is important, but we're seeing the shift now, which is giving people the control of whether or not they want their, uh, their uh, information shared and how it's being shared and just education and knowledge and transparency about it, I think is really the key. I do think you'll see younger people have a different relationship with privacy than the people who are actually writing the policies right now. And so it will continue to evolve over time. 
Allison, if you've got something to add, uh, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to ask what might be my last question. Yeah, go ahead for your, your last question. Okay. Because it actually it comes from uh, the room, as it were. Uh, and I, I sort of love where it goes um, in the sense that it, it hits on so many important things right now, which is the question was gaming has allowed previously excluded people, and for example, people with disabilities, uh, to participate socially. Can you speak to this? And when I read that, I think um, that's amazing and so true, right? Such a leveling. These platforms are so leveling, uh, which is, of course, their, their appeal. Uh, but it, all, it also occurs to me, um, uh, and I, I'm going to start with you, Allison, just in terms of how, peop how marketers need to be thinking differently uh, about this kind of wonderful fact, which is given how much we care uh, and are thinking more actively about inclusivity in every way, uh, how, how big a sea change is it that this is where the messaging is going to happen for a fast growing group of people that will have more and more power in our world? Um, you know, one of the the the, the motto of the um, Biden Harris Digital Team was was battle for the soul of the internet, and we um, we really believed in the power of it, the internet for good and for inclusivity and for um, for love and for empathy, and and we we believed that um, that. Uh, it was possible to to use the internet to tell a positive story and to connect with people. And I think this last question very much hits on that and shows all the positives of the internet, which is it's really a um, it's an equalizer. You know, it's very it's a it's a it's a democratic place where where someone in in their basement, you know, has the same broadcasting power as as NBC. And there's a there's there's a there's a there's a home for many different types of communities and for many groups of people and to find each other and to connect you know across the country across the world and i think it's you know it's essential for marketers to to know that and it's also um you know i i hope that people know that um that you know good and positive messages you know that can travel as well as sort of negative and and trolls and um, and that was something that was so deeply inspiring about the Biden Harris campaign. You know, to me personally, is how do we use internet and content and connectivity um, to to really reach people and to reach people on their own turf, how they want to be reached with authentic content and um, and so uh, uh, I'll leave it at that, but I think it's it's an inspiring message to end on, which is you know they, there's a home for everyone on the internet. There's communities for everyone, and it's it's our goal to kind of reach them and 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 connect with them in that way. I would say from my perspective, um, we we have a an incredible personal story to share. We we own um, one of the biggest esports organizations in the world, being Luminosity. We also own obviously a number of websites. And one of our websites had a reality competition called So You Think You Can Stream to find the next big gaming personality. And when we checked in after the finals, we found that the overwhelming fan favorite was a guy from uh, Detroit named Rocky. He was an incredible gamer and incredibly entertaining. And here's the thing. Rocky is a quadriplegic. Rocky plays with a quad stick and is the best gamer in the world using a quad stick. We immediately signed Rocky to Luminosity, and he's a star. He is inspiring all our players, um, NFL stars that are involved with us, like Richard Sherman, NHL stars like Ty Domi are sending messages and bragging about uh, hanging out with Rocky. People Magazine did a big feature on him, and he is a, uh, a star in the world of gaming. And and we're so proud of him, and we're not going to stop until we get a Rocky No Hands. That's his moniker, by the way, Rocky No Hands. Uh, we're not going to stop until we see his life story on Netflix. So I may reach out to my colleagues to help me with that. But that shows you um, the kinds of things that are happening, and I would agree with you, man. And uh, it's it's inspirational, it's equalizing, it's inclusive, and it's it's just really cool. All right, Heidi, try, try to top that one. It brought a tear to my eye, so let's go. That's a high bar. Last word to you. 
So, uh, so bringing it all home, we have to center ourselves on this generation and the fact that it is the most gener diverse generation in our lifetimes. And in the U.S., at least, uh, by 2024, the majority of the population will be non-white. And so the whole idea of inclusivity is going to take a completely different meaning with this generation. And I will say that with our youth advisors that we meet with on a regular basis, gaming was the number two thing they talked about inclusivity is the number one reason that they wanted to join the power players board and have a role in how they can make the game that they love so much available and welcoming and inclusive to all whether it's the color of your skin your gender identification your sexual preference or your you know your sled hockey your ability to actually play so what i this generation gives me the greatest hope of all uh, that they will truly change the world well, I love that note to finish on. Um, I have been uh, so enjoying talking to all of you. I know that people who are listening get so much out of it. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for giving your very valuable time. Um, Adrian, Allison, Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to Anita. Thanks. And I'll also echo that. Heidi, Adrian, Allison, on behalf of the Canadian Club, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a fascinating conversation. And I think if I reflect on what I heard all of you say, it's that if you want to reach the Gen Z cohort, you need to start by respecting them, respecting the video games that they love, and recognize that this is not a fringe idea. This is where the majority of your audience lives, and their behaviors are different from what we're used to before, and um, you, know, you would need to keep that in mind for starters. Amanda, as always, it's wonderful to have you to guide today's conversation. Guests, we hope that you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. On Wednesday, February 17th, we're going to be hosting a panel of trailblazing Black executives who are doing the work to nurture and amplify Black excellence and leadership in business. This expert panel with leaders from Capital One, CIBC, Boyden, and the Canadian Olympic Committee will highlight what's working, what we're missing, and how we can leverage immediate opportunities for a more equi equitable today and tomorrow. Thank you again to Norton Rose Fulbright for sponsoring today's event. And thank you to our AV sponsor, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Guests, thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy and stay safe.